I'm Craig Lawless. I'm Kevin Garcia King. And this is Sounds Like Infrastructure. Something I didn't know about Switzerland until recently was that they only joined the UN in 2002. To put that into perspective, that's 11 years after North Korea became a member. And to this day, Switzerland is not a member of the EU, not a part of NATO, and any countries that joined the UN since Switzerland, well, they didn't exist before. And the reason for this is that the Swiss don't do alliances, because an alliance means you've taken sides, and the Swiss don't take sides, they're neutral. This is a Switzerland we all know, and the reason they stayed out of the UN for so long. Historically though, the Swiss did actually used to fight battles. Like in about the 1500s, they used to aggress against other places and then they got beat once and they said, okay, this is it, we're homebound. It was around the 1500s that the Swiss decided it made more sense to stay put and stay out of battles. For the next 200 years or so, Switzerland was a relatively peaceful place. But then... When Napoleon came through, that changed things. And Even though Switzerland had said, we don't fight anymore, Napoleon crossed the border anyway, and stayed there for the next 17 years. When he was finally defeated, the Swiss wanted to make sure they wouldn't be invaded again, especially if they weren't fighting. It was around this time that the European powers got together in Paris to negotiate a number of peace treaties. And the Swiss saw their chance. They called their European neighbors together and said, look, we don't want to fight battles and we don't want to be invaded. We are Switzerland. We want to be neutral. Oh, and this time we want it in writing. The determination by all the European powers uh, and of course by the Swiss was that they would be neutral henceforth. And they've stuck to that. That's Stephen, by the way. Right, I'm Stephen Hallbrook. I have a PhD in philosophy and, and, and a law degree as well. Not only has Stephen a PhD and a law degree, but he's also written a number of books on Switzerland around the time of the Second World War. One of these books, Target Switzerland, looks at the strategies the Swiss used to stay neutral during this period. Although their neutrality had been official for more than 100 years, the Swiss now found themselves at the crossroads of fighting in Europe. Of course, on the north um, western border, there's France, southern border is Italy, and then Austria on the eastern side. The Germans were on the border with Switzerland from all sides. Although they were neutral, they knew that hadn't stopped Napoleon before, and they weren't convinced it would stop the Germans now. Today, of course, we know there was no invasion of Switzerland, but we also know... And there were these invasion plans in 1940, 1942, 1943, and as late as 1944, when the Germans occupied northern Italy. If they were going to stay neutral, the Swiss had to come up with a new strategy. So the military officials pulled out detail maps of their borders and thought, how can we stop an invasion here? What have we got that could be used in our defense if someone does invade? And that's when it clicked. They had a mountainous landscape with tunnels, bridges, and roads that all crossed it. They had infrastructure. One of these pieces of infrastructure was the St. Gotthard Tunnel in the Alps, close to the Italian border. It was built in 1882. 15 kilometers long. I think at the time it might have been one of the longest tunnels in the world. And the Swiss said to any potential invaders, We're just going to blow it up if, if, if you come here. So And it wasn't just the St. Gotthard Tunnel that the Swiss were willing to destroy to slow down an invasion. They had more than 3,000 points of demolition across the country on roads, tunnels, rock faces, train tracks, bridges, and who knows what else. All the bridges over the Rhine River were mined. Mined meaning rigged with explosives, of course. Bridges in, in the interior parts were mined. You know, you, you would just get the word and, and the men were ready to do exactly what they were assigned to do, to blow these places up. Stephen has actually seen some of these bridges that were rigged with explosives. It was just a, a little area in the, in the bridge where you couldn't see it, you know, from outside, but you kind of go down to where the water goes through. And it was just a, basically a covered slot. Not only were they planning on destroying bridges and other infrastructure, they also planned to flood the flatlands and remove key parts of machinery from factories. Different parts of machinery would be taken from factories and they had pre-planned hiding places in, in the mountains to put these essential parts so that the other stuff won't work. Or there would be plans, depending on the nature of it, to uh, simply throw things away into lakes and rivers. This was all part of a bigger strategy the Swiss had to stay neutral. And it wasn't a secret. 
In fact, they wanted the Germans to know. This is why it was so clever. Because the Germans knew what the Swiss were going to do if they did invade. And so they kept putting it off because it just wasn't worth it. The whole idea was to make it where it was not worth their while to go there. And um, it was a dissuasion, a strategy of dissuasion, and it really worked. When we think of explosives, we usually think of how the Swiss had planned to use them, to blow things up. But there's another side to explosives, a side that actually helps people, like the people in La Aldea, a small town of about 8,000 people in the northwest of Gran Canaria. La Aldea has these big volcanic mountains on one side and the ocean stretches out at the other, but it's kind of isolated from the rest of Gran Canaria. The locals used to call it an island in an island. But with 320 days of sunshine a year, it's not the worst place to be stuck. They got a beautiful weather for producing tomatoes and bananas. Those famous Canary Island bananas. It's amazing, it's a stunning landscape. There's only one small problem. It's, it's not easy to drive. That's Eduardo, by the way. Eduardo Gutierrez. And he's involved in a project that aims to solve this problem. You see, a while back, the government decided to build the ring road around Gran Canaria. They wanted to connect the villages and towns that dot the coastline with the capital, Las Palmas. But two towns didn't get a safe connection to the road because it was too difficult to build there. Those towns were El Risco and La Aldea. To get an idea of why it's so difficult to build there and why these towns were so isolated, you've just got to read the signs as you drive around. For example, one of them just simply says, In case of rain, you're not allowed to pass. The road that is connecting Agaete to El Risco, right now, you are not allowed to drive if it's raining. And even if it's not raining, it can still be dangerous. The last year was a very, very dry year, but it doesn't matter. So they were like spontaneous rock falls just in the middle of the day. One of these rock falls happened about five or six years ago on the road between El Risco and Agaete. The local police went to direct traffic while the rocks were being cleared when, out of nowhere, a second rock fall struck them, killing one of the officers. The local community petitioned the government to connect the ring road so they could avoid something like this happening again. And the government drew up plans to connect El Risco and Agaete, a project that would include eight kilometers of roads, tunnels and bridges. Eduardo and his team got the job of constructing more than six kilometers of tunnels on this road. So where do you start? The obvious choice for tunneling is a tunnel boring machine. But these machines are expensive to operate and would have been a nightmare to install in the area because of the landscape. So the team decided to use a technique called drill and blast, which involves drilling holes into the rock, filling these holes with explosives, and blasting away the rock to move forward. For each blast, they drill 140 holes into the rock face. Probably people are imagining that when you are blasting, it's all the 140 explosions at the same time, but it's not. So we got like micro timers in every detonator. So the explosion is starting like in the central point of the section pretty much. About 20 milliseconds after this first explosion, the second hole filled with explosives is detonated. 20 milliseconds later the third, again the fourth, and so on. It sounds like one explosion, but it's really 140 perfectly timed separate explosions. And for a project like this, the team needs a lot of explosives. In our case, we have to use about 1 million kilos of explosives. That's 1 million kilos for the whole project, or about 2,500 kilos a day. In any other country, that might be fine. But because of a history of terrorist attacks from groups like ETA, Spain has some of the strictest policies on explosives in the world. So we, we need police escort. They have to be in a very special vehicle. You have to notice them 48 hours prior to, to do any transport. And among a ton of other regulations... You are not allowed to transport explosives during the nights. All this becomes a proper headache when, like Eduardo, you've got a team of engineers working 24-7. And those same engineers need 5,000 kilos of explosives every two days to complete their job. And that's the challenging thing, because due to the Spanish regulation, the total volume that we can uh, store in a, in a magazine... Where you store explosives... Is just 10,000 kilos. And those 10,000 kilos of explosives, which are in a concrete bunker covered with one meter of soil and a blast-proof door... 
must be located far away from roads, from properties, and far away for heritage uh, monuments or whatever. Bringing a truck full of explosives to the site every two days would be a nightmare, so Eduardo and the team had to innovate. They looked to Australia, where Eduardo himself had spent five years working and found an explosives company there. And they offered us the possibility of manufacturing the explosives on site. Instead of transporting 1 million kilos of explosives on public roads, they would now only have to transport 50,000, a whopping 95% less explosives moving through public roads and shipping routes. That is a significant reduction of the risk for everybody. Instead of transporting explosives, which are class 1 and need a police escort, they were now transporting corrosive materials, which fall into class 5. There are still regulations to follow, but they're not as strict. These materials would form the bulk of the explosives, but without being mixed and charged, don't actually do anything. When they have these materials mixed and ready, they then add 25 grams of a very high power explosive for all the chain reaction that is required for this material to be explosive. Basically, without the 25 grams of explosives, the class 5 materials won't do anything. And this is the trick. By mixing and making the explosives on site, the team can continue to work 24-7 and not worry about transporting tens of thousands of explosives each week. They only need 50,000 kilos of actual explosives, which is used in such small amounts that it's almost always available on site. This technique has been used in other parts of the world, but it's the first time it's been used in Spain. The Spanish government only made it legal in 2017. And the innovation has meant that the tunnel can be built within budget and on time. And, most importantly, for the people of El Risco and La Aldea, they'll get a safer road for their communities. It's really, really, really benefit. I mean, because they will be connected to Las Palmas and to the rest of the island, to the airport and the rest of the island, with a very safety road and in a shorter period of time. So they are going to be able to work, for instance, in Las Palmas, not wasting a lot of time during the, during the driving. We often think of explosives as a form of destruction. In the case of the Swiss, it was destruction to help protect themselves. And it worked, because they didn't actually have to blow up any of their infrastructure. And then there's the use of explosives to help connect people and places, like they're doing in Gran Canaria, by tunneling through one of the most difficult landscapes you can work in while also making sure that the landscape remains just as beautiful when the work is done. And finally, if you do visit Switzerland, don't worry, because the last of the explosive infrastructure was discharged in 2010 on a bridge near the Italian border. Or so they say. This episode of Sounds Like Infrastructure was produced by myself, Craig Lawless, and Kevin Garcia King. Craig was also our editor for this episode. Thanks to Eduardo and Stephen for chatting to us, and don't forget to check out Stephen's book Target Switzerland if you want to know more about the Swiss during World War II. And of course, Ferrobial is on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, where you can see pics and learn more about projects like this one. If you liked the episode, share it with your friends and tweet us at Ferrovial if you have any stories about infrastructure you think we should include in any future episodes. I'm Kevin Garcia-King. And I'm Craig Lawless.